right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dismantling the Patriarchy 101 HR Edition. I'm Dawn Putney, and I'm uh, the president and chief strategist of a company called Toolbox Creative. And we are a brand marketing firm who works with technologists, and we love groups like Type. And additive manufacturing is one of our, one of our areas of focus because we really believe that women and technology will save the planet. So one of the things that a lot of our, or a couple of things that our clients have been asking for of us a lot lately is branding and materials as they're recruiting, you know? So there's still, despite all the layoffs happening in technology, there's still a real need for top level talent at a lot of the organizations we're working with. And it's tough to recruit, especially with a group like type where you're, you're talking to primarily women. It's like, how do you recruit more women into organizations that can be really traditionally seen as primarily masculine or male? So we're really helping them do a lot of work on what does that look like? And how can you, what does your em employer brand look like? Right. And how can we help you make it even better? So this was a really pretty fascinating stat that I dug up which is when you're talking to job seekers, they are making decisions based on this criteria. I think this came, yeah, from the Guardian. So location, not a big surprise is first and foremost, their decision-making. And second to that is the opportunity for development and advancement in careers. But third is the image of the employer, right? So I think that's a pretty critical piece that a lot of times maybe gets overlooked when you're thinking about how you're gonna speak to potential candidates and what that looks like. So. With that in mind, we really will are going to focus on what that employer branding is. So this, I don't know where this definition came from, Wikipedia or something, right? But the package of functional and economical and psychological benefits provided by an employer and identify with the employee organization. Boring, boring, boring. That's the tricky part, right? Is that employer branding expresses that identity of an organization. But how, you know, when's the last time you were emotionally moved by corporate speak or something that's been approved by legal, right? So that's where it gets tricky, is that it really is often presented in a very corporate manner when we're really thinking about it from human-centered design and what that looks like. So, and for us, what that means is that brand is your culture. People are, based on what we're seeing in all the research, people are looking for meaning in their work, especially if you're looking to hire millennials. That's a big thing that we're hearing over and over and over again is, People want to make a difference. Now, the good news is in additive manufacturing, we can actually do that, right? I think that's part of the magic of a new technology, or it's not even that new a technology, but, but what's next in manufacturing is how are the folks who are working in additive manufacturing going to leave the world better than they found it? And they actually have an opportunity to do that. So that's pretty cool. But if your brand and your culture isn't reflected in your employer brand, you're not gonna get that information out there. So the good news is there's tons of research out there. HR is big, big business. And there's a lot of academic studies and surveys that have really gone out and asked employees what it is they're looking for in an employer and what's, what is that desirability? That's a word you see a lot if you start doing this research. So the top five there, again, are kind of the best work environment. Obviously location falls into that. Uh, what's your opportunity for growth, right? What's gonna happen at the company once you do sign on? What are you getting paid? No big surprise there either. Flexibility is huge, especially when you're talking about recruiting women. It's big for everybody, but now more than ever, uh, women are looking for that flexibility. So that may be a hybrid workplace, right? You work from home part of the time, you work on location part of the time. Everybody defines flexibility a little differently, but at least talking about flexibility in your 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 employer brand is an important piece of that. And then again, that cultural and social responsibility. If you're at this type conference, you're probably already part of this world that's looking at employing women in traditionally masculine roles. So we're gonna explore that a little bit more too. So the other way that we look at that is really a people first approach, right? So what does that mean? Let's get this out of there. Um, much as I would love to not use Microsoft, as an example, especially considering that they just had a big layoff, they really have done a good job over the years of thinking about people first instead of the jobs you're trying to fill first. So this example here 
from Microsoft's career page. I'm not sure if it's it, it looks like this anymore, but originally, you know, they're not posting job names on the top of their career page. They are asking the potential candidates a question like, well, do what you love, right? What do you want to do? What What is the future you want to create? Um, there's even women in this image here, right? So I think that's really, really important to think about <clears throat> what's the first impression when people either get to your website or more importantly, that careers page on your website and what does that look like? So um, you'll get to inclusive job descriptions, but first impression, you know, you have, what is it, a second and a half to get somebody's attention when they land on a web page now? So thinking about how you can do that in a way that's really compelling. I even like that they break this down by careers overall, but where you are in your um, current level of jobs, right, for professionals, students, and graduates. And then they have a whole section about life at Microsoft, which is really, really pretty compelling. Pretty cool stuff. Whoops. So when we talk about those inclusive job descriptions, we're talking about language. Words really, really, really matter. And nuance in those words makes a big, big impact. So this actually came from LinkedIn, I think, who did a study with Fox. Um, and just using the word aggressive in a job description. You'd be surprised how many job descriptions talk about being an aggressive company or aggressively you know, doing business. 44% of women who took this survey said they would be, wouldn't likely apply for a job that used the word aggressive in it, and 33% of men, right? So you're eliminating close to half of the women who are looking for jobs and a third of the men who are out there looking for jobs just by including that one word in your job description. So what does that look like? Well, for us today, again, we're here about high hire women. Um, despite most HR people may, that are running HR organizations being female, there's a lot of really masculine language used in hiring and jobs description. And we've kind of used the same old model over and over and over again. It's really time to, to throw that out and rethink this from a human perspective. You know, it, it is about fixing that broken rung on the ladder for women. It's not just about hiring at technical levels, but in leadership and moving people up through leadership. So two of the big things in the studies, again, that we're reading are showing that role models are huge for getting women into jobs and gender neutral language, right? So you don't have to be overly flowery feminine and you don't have to be so masculine. So what does gender neutral language look like for this piece? This is a study that was done by the Forte Foundation, I believe was one of the big Ivy League universities. I can't remember which one, but I thought this was pretty fascinating because a lot of the folks that we work with are looking to hire engineers. Well, engineers in and of itself is a pretty masculine word or it's perceived that way. It's shifting, but overall it's, it's kind of considered a pretty male dominated world. So they did a lot of studies on using feminine and masculine masculine language and just how a little shift in language can have a big impact. So right, you know, from the beginning, I think it's really interesting here, right? The masculine version of this job description says, we're a dominant engineering firm that boasts many leading clients. We are determined to stand apart from the competition. So there are words in here like competition, dominant, determined that are considered very masculine. The feminine version of that, which I like, it's a little warmer and fuzzier, are we are a community of engineers who have effective relationships with many satisfied clients. We are committed to understanding the engineering sector intimately, right? Like just, you're saying the same thing. You're having, it's just the difference between when people read what is perceived as masculine versus feminine. The other really great piece of this study, the takeaway that I loved was that while women will be turned off by masculine language, men are not turned off by the neutral or more feminine language, right? So you don't have to worry about getting too, moving too far away from masculine because really as long as you stay neutral and think about it from the perspective of kind of a more holistic approach, you're not gonna turn off male candidates either. So that's pretty pretty interesting to me. Also, you know, other words in here, right? Like proficient oral and written communication still. Skills versus strong. And right, it's just like, oh my gosh, this little, little tweak that have a huge, huge impact on this. And not everything has to change, right? Creating quality engineering designs is just what it is, right? That's already neutral. 
But even thinking about <clears throat> the other thing that I read in this study that was fascinating is a lot of times in a job description, it's going to ask for a number of years of experience. And really to be more neutral there, folks are moving away from that because one, it can either be ageist because what if your job listing says two to seven years of experience, but you're a candidate that has 25 years of experience, can you apply for that same role, right? So that's that's actually starting to be um, eliminated from job descriptions a little bit more. Um, so there's all kinds of cool tips and tricks out there when you want to find this. And if you download this presentation, I've got all the links to the resources that I use in the speaker notes as well. So, right, what are those words? Here's one I'm really guilty of. We, you know, guys. Guys is considered a kind of a, I could be in a room full of women and say, hey guys, and it's tough. Like I have to stop and think twice about it, right? Like I've, I use folks a lot. Um, that's a, a word that I didn't use until my husband introduced it because he calls his family folks. And I'm like, folks, pretty neutral. That's a good one. That could be a little bit of everybody. So just thinking about, you know, like even the word chairman, a lot of times you'll see an administrative assistant job, which smacks female and they work for the chairman. I immediately picture a woman working for a man when I hear a job description like that. So really thinking through what you can do to eliminate like workmanship, right? Like, oh my gosh, how, what, what are you going to replace workmanship with? Look for that alternate at language and see what you can do to find that. This same study from the Forte Foundation actually has a whole list of masculine and feminine words and how you can think about those. These are not one-to-one -one swap outs. It's really just a list of words. But, you know, it's interesting to see words, you know, and again, it's like, that asterisk is like any version of that word. So whether it's hyphenated or what that looks like, but you know, even some of these were really surprising to me. You know, so when I look at words like courage, that doesn't feel masculine to me, but in the testing that they've done, they have seen where some of these fall a little bit more on the masculine side versus the feminine side. Last time I did this presentation, somebody asked me then, okay, if I know I'm gonna be interviewing with a man, should I, you, my resume or my cover letter mail. And again, I, I wouldn't take that chance, right? I would I would look at neutral because you never know who's going to be looking at that cover letter or that resume in the long run. Um, so really thinking about what you can use in that language that's really going to kind of keep things a little less um, slanted one way or the other. Okay, so how do you do that? We're actually big believers in implementing a master plan for you know, what's that master culture plan? What does that look like? This doesn't happen on accident and it needs to be done with intent because the way we've been doing it for ever, for beyond decades, right, is pretty skewed to male and masculine. So what does that look like? You've really got to work with your company to put together a plan. So thinking about your how you're presented in the world, how, what people are gonna see when they get to your website, better yet to your career's website. Why is it worth it, right? It's a lot of effort. Is it worth that effort? Absolutely, 100% worth the effort. Because what we're seeing is, again, in the research that's out there, is that when you've got a really good reputable employer brand, you are gonna recruit better candidates. Uh, you can reduce hiring and marketing costs, which is pretty fascinating, right? Like you can bring your costs down just by putting a little bit of this effort up front and then improving the productivity, right? HR is big work and it takes a lot to get people in the door. Um, and it's also to me, it's like as much as I, you see, you know, Indeed does a lot of advertising out there and people start, often will start with Indeed or in LinkedIn looking for a job. But if they land on your website after finding whether that job description is even written well enough, when they land there and then get to your website, if they're turned off, they're just gonna go to the next job down on the list. So looking good is as big a piece of this as anything else, right? So we are seeing over and over again that an attractive brand really is bargaining power, right? If you're looking to hire, this gives you a leg up if you've got a good looking brand. And again, hiring brand, employer brand, but overall brand is a big piece of that. The fact that people want to be associated with your brand is a big part of what's going on as well. And again, you see that word desirability over and over and over again. So what we love about this is that design and brand matters and it, and it matters a lot. This was a website we stumbled across when we were working on a campaign for one of our clients. This is not our client. I thought this was just such an interesting 
campaign or landing page for careers because this is a blue collar, hard work job. I don't love that the type is over the woman's face, right? They could have paid a little bit more attention to the design on this one. But I do love that they do show a man and a woman on the home, on the landing page for careers. And they also have, right, they're speaking people first. So it's not the job listing straight up front. It's your career awaits you. And of course, this group has the benefit of being one of the best places to work in Pennsylvania. So that's a huge thing to put on their website. But also just walking through that and seeing, you know, that your career opportunities are, right? They're not talking about jobs. They're talking about careers. This is the other one. I just absolutely love this. People, we have such a short attention span with everybody in the world right now. So a lot of times if you're looking at one of the standard services that big HR companies use to list jobs, you're going to see a menu over on the left that you got to pick your state and hopefully pick the right region and figure all that out. The fact that they've made it so simple that you can first search for a job by the state just by clicking on a big picture of your state is awesome. I also like that they made North Carolina almost as big as Texas because that's pretty awesome. I think Pennsylvania is too. But you drill down on this website and you can also search by region. So again, thinking about what's quick, what's effective. If you're looking for people and running a campaign in a specific region and they can get to a page like this and click on the state they're interested in without having to read a single word, it's pretty pretty fascinating. I just, I love everything about that site. The other thing about employer brands that I find is so important is just that you got to be thinking about this as the promise you make, right? That's the thing that branding and marketing folks are going to tell you all the time, that this is not just about your reputation, but it's a promise that you're making. You are asking people for their personal passion, right? Their enthusiasm, their dedication, right? You want to keep employees for a long time. So while pay and experience are important, the fact that you're asking people to like, oh, wait, and we want 40 hours or more of your life every week. Um, so please, please leave us and come work for us. So again, what we're seeing there is flexibility, 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 a lot of people. Now that's not always possible, right? Some jobs are on location and that's just what you have to do with, but then there's other flexibility in there, right? It may not mean a hybrid workplace, but it may mean that you can swap out. You can come in at 6 a.m. and leave at 3 p.m. when your kids are home from school, or you can come in at 10 a.m. and leave at 7 p.m. if that's what works for you, right? So there's all kinds of ways to define flexibility if you're the kind of company that can offer that as a benefit, it is a benefit that people are looking for. Again, creativity, right? Who doesn't love the idea of going to the job and having some you know, creative fun during the day? Innovation, again, additive manufacturing, you guys are ripe for this, right? There's all kinds of innovation happening in that world. And then a lot of technology. And again, thinking about human-centered benefits. So that one, I feel is, is a no brainer when it comes to implementing things like this. So what we're talking about there are things like mental health support, well-being check-ins, right? Just checking in with people to see how they're doing when you know something's going on. Mentorship programs is huge, especially in this world of engineering where women are looking to get into engineering jobs. We're finding more and more that they're listing mentorship or networking as the number one reason that they get involved at a certain company or in a career and stay involved. Um, conferences, right? That's another piece too. Allowing your staff to go to conferences and it may be a conference that doesn't necessarily fit right within your work product, right? You know, if one of my employees came to me and said, oh, I want to go to a conference about bird watching and here's why. Great, because we also do a thing called toolbox talks at our office, which says, okay, if you're going to learn that cool thing, then you got to come back and tell us about it. So we want every employee to come in and if it's work related, great, that's fun. But we've had toolbox talks on everything from hip hop to puppies visiting the office to barbecue taste offs, right? So I think there's an opportunity there to, and, and I know when you're punching a clock and thinking about people getting the work done, this can be a stretch to be thinking about how you do that, but it really doesn't take a lot of effort there to have a really big impact. Um, and, and again, just be being thinking of, be thinking about what are those personal things that you can do to help people view you as one of those desirable employers. So 
So some other things too about thinking about breaking the mold, again, go to Indeed, look at any job description there, look what those websites look like, right? It is like a wall of information that people have to slog through and then send an anonymous resume out to an anonymous machine that maybe will read their cover letter and their resume if they're lucky because they're looking for keywords. So how do you change that, right? How do you get candidates into your organization rather than being kind of a part of this machine? Um, so we're big believers in thinking about how you can break the mold. So candidate first approach, again, going back and looking at those two examples that I shared with you, people first, what they want, what they love, rather than all about the company first. 90% of the job descriptions I read out there right now start with a blurb about the company. And typically it's a pretty boring, again, lawyer approved blurb about the company rather than being about the person that we're talking to. Social media is huge, right? Instagram. Facebook, of course, in the right places, that's right. Facebook actually does have a good tool for posting your job and being able to accept resumes. And you can do a custom job description there too. So even though Facebook has its challenges right now, it is a great place to post your job postings and accept resumes. Um, TikTok, people are employed, you know, they are looking for employees on TikTok or they're doing cool, here's what our company's all about stuff on TikTok to try to get people back to their careers page, sharing what's happening behind the scenes, right? That's another big cool thing about social media is you don't have to always be talking about the day-to-day -day work, but what's going on behind the scenes at that work. Uh, show women, you know, that's another big thing is showing the female leadership, getting testimonials from them, showing people that look like the folks you want to attract to your business is a big piece of this as well. And then looking for your current employees, right? What can they do to help support your efforts online and talk about all this good stuff online? This is a great tool too. Again, the link is in this download. It's already, look, seven years old, but there's great information in here. I think there's also a lot of implicit and explicit bi bias going on in the workplace. And when that is really obvious, on a website when you get there, it shuts people down right away. So there are some really cool um, tips and tricks on that document um, that I love, right? Oops, let me go back. I didn't mean to go to their website. Well, go to their website. It's a great place to go. All right, so there's some great tools and tips and tricks in this document if you wanna download this PowerPoint or this presentation. Um, but I think it's really a, a great thing to be thinking about, you know, asking where the diverse talent is and going and looking for it, right? A lot of times we'll hear, well, you know, we put a job posting out there and we only found only two women applied. There's events that are focused on women hiring, like types recruitment, or what do they call it? Their hiring campaign or their, their recruitment day tomorrow. So look for candidates where you can find them, right? And that's, again, where social media is a really great opportunity to do that. And, all right, so here's another one that we do. We're big believers in thinking about that brand culture. So around our office, our Monday morning meetings, we have a big long meeting every Monday that goes through our production schedule and what we're gonna do that week and what the plan is. But we always start with, hey, how was your weekend? What did you do? We used to do these meetings and only talk business and they were the worst possible hour of the week. So we really shifted to, thinking about that human centered approach, talking, you know, making sure that we're all connecting on a human level before talking about work stuff. And one of the ways we do that is we all have this cute little planner that will allow us to think about what it is your top five things of the day. I know efficiency experts say you can't have more than five. I usually have 10 on this list, so I, I don't buy it, but the goal is for five. And then looking at, we talk about, we do the Rosebud Thorn exercise, right? What was the highlight of your week last week when it comes to work? We actually added a fourth in there from talking about what was the best thing that happened in your work week last week? What has the most potential with that bud? And then what kind of sucked, right? What was the thorn? But then we also had a personal piece onto that, right? Because we're talking about what's happening in our lives. It's not always about work. So we love looking at this from the personal perspective as well. It just gives people a little bit of information about what it's like to work with you. And it even gives you an opportunity to share some of those stories, right? I think that's the other piece of this is like, when you're thinking about your employer brand, 
you've got an opportunity to talk to folks and attract people in a way that's very unique and a little different than everything else out there. So if you'd like to know more about this, like I said, there's tons of resources in this document. So feel free, to go ahead and grab it. You can either go to bit.ly toolbox, TBX for toolbox type recruit, or just snap that QR code and it'll get you to this document and you'll have all kinds of information in there. So thank you everybody for showing up today. Thanks for your attention and let me know uh, if you have any questions.